Well, hello and welcome to the PMQ Live update for today, which is March 11th, Thursday, March 11th. But it's not actually a PMQ Live update. This is a uh, one of the inaugural episodes of, uh, actually, I guess it's probably our second episode of All Things Dough, Pizza Quest, All Things Dough with Peter Reinhardt. So what we're going to be trying to do here, folks, is get Peter Reinhardt on here every month to kind of tackle different dough questions. We'll kind of feel out what the industry is looking for as far as answers in the in the dough area. And Peter's your guy. He's going to be able to help us answer them. So, Peter, why don't you just, uh, again, say hello, introduce yourself, and then we'll kind of jump into it. Well, it's good to be with you, Brian. I, I'm, I'm always uh, thrilled to be able to talk about anything having to do with pizza and especially the dough aspect, which I always consider to be the most important part of any pizza is the crust. Uh, some people say it's 80% of the pizza. Some people say it's 90%. Some people say it's 50, 50, you know, everybody decides where they want to land on that spectrum, but I am an 80, 20 guy. No, I, I agree with you, man. It's uh, you can't, you can't paint a good picture if you don't have a good canvas and that's, that's where it well starts. Said. And then, Great. and then number two, I definitely think mine is, is dough sauce and cheese in that order i think uh -huh. and but that's up for debate and when they're when you have everything working <laughs> it's, it's worth waiting for absolutely and then that's a you know that debate is up for a different uh you know a whole different episode we can we can yeah. have that conversation all day but i do want to let everybody watch and know that you can ask your questions here uh, of peter live you put them in the facebook comments and we'll get to them uh he'll be happy to answer any questions you have about dough but today we're going to be talking about two uh i mean basic aspects of uh of pizza making uh first i think we're going to be talking about the uh the the baking triangle which i'm going to show everybody here um this is basically you know, the one, two, three step of, you know, it's all a triangle and it, and it kind of revolves around itself. And then we're also going to, uh, manage, uh, you know, what is baking? Yeah. I think it's here. I got to find that picture. I'm sorry, guys. We but, take, uh, we take those things for granted. We use, we, we use the term baking all the time. Not everybody thinks about well, what do we mean when we talk about baking? Why don't we stay on that one, uh, Brian, for a second. Okay. And this is, as, and we'll just kind of talk about these two, uh, this is part of a longer just sort of PowerPoint thing I did on on what mm -hmm. goes on during the process of baking bread or or pizza doughs. And that is uh, it begins with the idea that we're baking it. And uh, I think it helps to have this sort of fundamental foundation of uh, what we mean. So number one, baking simply means, and this is textbook, that it's the application of heat to a product in an enclosed environment, meaning the oven for the purpose of driving off moisture. And that's the key phrase. Well, we all know it's going in an oven, but why do we do it? It's for the purpose of driving off moisture. Now that's a pretty broad general you know, definition of baking and it can mean a whole lot of different things and it doesn't get real specific. So we're gonna talk a little bit later about what more is going on when we bake uh, and what transformations are taking place in the product itself because dough, and bread is nothing more than a transformational food, a food that is made by the transformation of its various components in from one thing into something else. And that's the magic of, of dough and bread is that it, it, it transforms, it changes before our very eyes from one thing into something else. And it all happens, you know, in this, in this sort of box that we call baking. And then uh, if you want to go to that other slide, we'll just throw that. I'm going to, we're just laying these out there as, as sort of you know, again, reference points. We'll come back to maybe all of these and touch on them later. Well, and that's and that's what I was going to say is because we were actually good. We're going to be talking about the the benefits of long fermentation. So this kind of yeah. goes into that. So these are the building blocks that we have to we have to see. Now, Tim Rosh, he's already put up uh, a couple questions. Um, so Tim, we definitely will we'll get to those. You know about uh, you know best oils used in dough, um, and then uh, some flour questions. I don't know if we'd be able to answer those, but. Um, that could be another show too. So, well, but anyway, the baking triangle. Shot. Yeah, so yeah let's, absolutely. Let's get this other piece of information out there, just so we have it as reference. And I don't know if you can all read it, but you know, I came up with this concept called the baking triangle. So we talked about what baking is. So baking is right in the center of this triangle, and the three most important components of the process of baking, and again, we'll call this this process a transformational process, are time, temperature, and ingredients. And those will so we'll put those on the three points of the triangle, and those three come together and go into the oven, so to speak. And everything that happens 
during the baking process affects one or all of these or, or are affected by one or all of those points. And in fact, if you affect any one point on that triangle, it definitely has impact and effect on the other points. So what, what sort of is wonderful about baking is, is that there's an awful lot of options and flexibility into what we can do to create a baking outcome. And that means that we can impact the, the ingredients, the choices we make in ingredients, you know, have some effect on, on how much time they need, uh, the temperatures that we use, whether it's for fermentation or baking, affect the time required and the ingredients themselves are impacted by both the time and the temperature. So all these things are working in concert. And the, the key point here is basically to know that, that you can manipulate time by manipulating temperature. You can manipulate the ingredients by manipulating the time and the temperature. And all these things are under your control, the control of the baker, uh, and the choices that you make result in the final outcomes. And so if you're not happy with the outcomes you're currently getting, all you need to know is that I can tweak any one of these points and it will affect the other points and I just need to know what's gonna happen when I make those tweaks. And, and you can make those decisions, which brings us to questions like, how long should I ferment my dough? And how much mm -hmm. yeast should I put in my dough? You know, and what's going on when I make those choices? What temperature should I be fermenting them at? Uh, you know, if I'm gonna do a short or a long fermentation. And all these things are, well, there's a, there's a, a range. And there's no, I'm gonna say, it's, even though there's a lot of people who have pizza rules about what's, what's appropriate, uh, I would say that the only rule that really matters is the final outcome, the flavor. The flavor rule is the flavor rules, and that's going to determine the choices that we make. Your system at, the, at your operation uh, may determine how long you have or how much space you have for longer or shorter fermentations. Uh, the amount of refrigeration you have can be a factor. All these things are factors, but you can make those choices, and there's no, no one that can come in and say, that's the wrong choice, unless... Yeah unless the choice leads to a bad outcome, a bad pizza. And if that's no. your problem, then you got to make some changes. But let the pizza decide that for you, and then and don't let anyone come in and say, the rule is that you have to do it this way. Because the only rule that really matters is the flavor rule. No, actually, anybody who comes in and says they know everything about those, uh, well, probably not sincere. <laughs> it's like try, there, there are so many that. options. It's like counting the stars in the sky. So yeah. I did want to let everybody know that uh, we're going to get to a lot of information. I do want to, I'm going to get Tim's first question uh, asked right really quick, but there are other questions. This is going to live live on Facebook. So we can come back and revisit this if we don't get to your question in your time, because I know you guys are all really busy and, and with a subject like dough, we're going to go on for quite a bit. So um, I just want to let you know, put those questions up there, but come back and revisit the, uh, the the video on PMQ's Facebook just to get the answers if we don't get to it in real time. Yeah, and if um, we don't get to it today, we're going to keep coming back and we'll we'll do it again and again until we cover yeah. as much as we can and, until we exhaust what I know, which who knows, we may run out of things to say after one episode, but I think I think it's fathomless, so we'll probably have a lot of, a lot of revisits. Oh, Tim, man, you got, I got a whole nother show for you, my buddy. He keeps putting up there. So um, that's awesome. I love it. But let's just ask first one. He wants to know what are the best oils to use in dough are. Um, and this maybe could lead into the long fermentation. What's the best oil to use in a long fermentation dough versus something that's going to be shorter? Well, that oils and fats, we'll say oils fall in the category of fat. And fat has a function. Whenever, whenever I, I teach at Johnson and Wales University, and you know my students there, uh, the method that we use in teaching our baking students is that we really focus on functionality of ingredients and functionality of, of choices and you know temperatures and things like that. So function kind of is part of what determines certain things. Uh, and the two basic categories of fats that we teach are solid fats and liquid fats. The liquid fats we call oil. And the solid fats we typically call fat or shortening. And solid fats could be anything from lard to, to uh, Crisco type shortenings to uh, uh, chicken schmaltz. You know, anything that's a solid fat, solid at room temperature. Those are solid fats. And liquid, liquid oils are fats that are liquid at room temperature. The interesting thing is, is that they are, they do function slightly differently. And, and, and starting with number one, that, that if a fat solidifies at room temperature, then it doesn't melt, then it has, it kind of performs differently when you mix the dough. 
a lot of old time ba uh, bakers or you know long time uh, pizza makers and bread bakers also feel that that solid fat actually produces a better product. I've never really subscribed to that theory. I think it may uh, because it allows you to mix your dough a little bit longer, develop your gluten structures, you know, more organized uh, because it takes longer for that fat to kind of break down and coat the proteins that prevent uh, the gluten from really holding the dough together. So, so solid fat plus when the dough is cold, those fats solidify again and they give your dough a little bit more uh, substance. Uh, some people feel that that will also allow your dough to rise more when you put it in the oven. And it may or may not be true. It's arguable. But okay. I've always been a liquid fat guy because, number one, uh, I'm also concerned about um, the, the breakdown in your own body, your ability to digest those fats. And I find that solid fats, because they are, the reason they're solid is, is they're hydrogenated, whether naturally or through you know, whipping to uh, add more hydrogen into them, they, it makes it a little bit more difficult for your body to break those down and digest them. In a pizza dough, it's not that big of a deal because there's so little fat. It's not like we're putting in, you know, 20, 30 percent fat like you would in a brioche dough. In a pizza dough, there's maybe, right. maybe an average of maybe three to five to seven percent fat to, to flour. So it's not that critical of an issue, digestibility. But I've always felt like why not use olive oil since I love the flavor of olive oil uh, better? But there are some doughs, and I'm seeing more and more. Now, butter as a fat and uh, and also a lard as a fat. Uh, and both butter and lard are great for flavor. Uh, butter especially probably is the most flavorful. I just saw, you know, uh, one of those uh, um uh, Tucci, uh, Stanley Tucci shows where he's traveling through, oh, yeah. through Italy and in Northern Italy, it's all about butter and in Southern Italy, it's all about olive oil. And, and so they argue amongst themselves of which is a better one to use, but you use what you have. And, uh, and so I think that butter is wonderful for flavor. Um, uh, it, it lard and other kinds of solid fats are great because they're a hundred percent fat. So when you have, we'll just say, uh, 28 grams or an ounce, of lard, you have 28 grams of solid fat. If you have 28 grams of butter, about 80% of that 28 grams is butter fat, and 20% is is water, whey, you know, milk solids, other things than fat. So there's percentage-wise, the amount of fat is is more predictable when you're using liquid oil, which is 100% fat, or or solid fat like uh, like lard, butter. Okay. You know, you're trading off flavor, but you're not getting as much fat. So you may have to increase the amount of butter if you feel that you're not getting the functionality of those fats. And then in the end, the, the, the fat will have its effect on the dough. Number one, it will retain moisture. It'll help the dough retain some of its moisture when it bakes. Because remember, we're driving off moisture when we bake the product. And, then, yeah. and when you're baking a bread, or, or a, we'll just stick with the pizza. If you're doing Neapolitan pizza in an 800 degree oven, it's in the oven for about a minute. You know, it, it doesn't, you're not driving off all the moisture. It puffs up and, it, and you drive off some moisture when you're baking it. But in one minute, you can't evaporate off all the moisture in there. So that's one of the reasons why that dough will be crisp for about 60 seconds. And then it starts to soften and soften because the moisture that is left behind in the dough begins to soften the crust. And that's all part of the charm of that style. If you want a very solid, crispy, toffee-like uh, crust, then you want to drive off more of that moisture. So you would bake at a lower temperature, going to that triangle, lower temperature, longer time, drive off more moisture before you get to the caramelization point, which is, again, one of the transformations that takes place that we haven't really gone into yet. But all these things you know, are factors that are part of the choice based on the style of pizza that you're, you want to make. So, so right, for instance, well, in the Neapolitan pizza, you're not going to see any fat or oil in the dough because it doesn't need it. It's in the oven for such a short amount of time that, that you don't need it to, to kind of hold on to that moisture. If you're going to be in the oven for a longer time or if you're using a higher protein flour, such as a high, you know, high gluten, uh, all Trump's type flour, then you would want some fat because it tenderizes the proteins, which are very hard and chewy. So, the, again, it's a balancing act. Baking in the end is a balancing act between time, temperature, and ingredients, and the functionality of those, you know, of those ingredients such as fat, you know, uh, will also be affected by time and temperature. 
Well, and that was one question, and we haven't even gotten to the main topic. So I'm going to cut you off here, Peter. You're done. You're done. Okay. So <laughs> salud. Um, no, no, that was great. And, and I actually just wrote it down, that oil and dough. Thank you again for that, Tim. That's uh, that's a whole other another episode. So. If that doesn't so, uh, so, uh, answer your question, write to us. And, and, of course, you can always write to me. Uh, can I get my e email address for people who want to just throw questions Absolutely. at me? Absolutely. Please I'll, do. I'll type right. it in. Yeah, there. Uh, you can write to me at peter at pizzaquest.com. PizzaQuest is one word, peter at pizzaquest.com. And, uh, you know, if I can, I'll try to troubleshoot questions there as well. Awesome. And we love the uh, the, the accessibility that our, our guests have. So um, Peter at – there we go. So it's, yeah. it's going to be up in the comments. It should be something you can either copy down or just uh, uh, click directly. Tim, thank you so much. He also has another good question, which I definitely like, as it's talking about dough calculators. But I think we want to uh, – I want to put that off to a little bit later um, because that's a whole other big topic. But, uh, you know, definitely – Thank you so much for the, the participation. And yeah. we will either, if we can't get to it today, Tim, we'll, we'll get to it in another time and another episode of All Things Dough. But I want to kind of I'm jump just in. Glad Tim is so engaged. <laughs> well, there, we're getting some more. So we might even just, whatever we were going to talk about today might not even be that. It just might be the free for all for Peter Reinhardt. But um, oh, I lost you there. I think we lost some things, connectivity. <laughs> all Things Dough, Peter Reinhardt, and he's ready to answer your questions live here. But we were talking about long fermentation. I mean, what are the benefits of long fermentation if you can kind of like in a two to three minute um, summation of that? But, but what is the benefits of doing something uh, of, in a long ferment? Either be it, I guess, what 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 is considered long ferment? 48 hours or 36? Up the Good question. The question keeps being asked. Is 24 hours enough? Is, too many, is, is 48 too much? Uh, so ultimately, again, the only reason to make any of these choices is flavor. Does so if we're if the reason that I'm a big advocate of long slow fermentation is is that I believe that it produces more flavor in your dough and here's the reason why. Dough itself, well let's just, let me take a step back. I tell my students that the mission of the baker is to evoke the full potential of flavor trapped in the grain, since the flour or the grain is the primary ingredient in a dough. Uh, it's your job to get the most flavor that's trapped in there. And by trapped, I mean there is a lot of flavor in flour that we don't taste if we just eat flour, you know, by itself because the flavors are all trapped in the starch molecules. So what we taste is starch, and starch has no flavor at all. But something happens, and again, this comes back to the transformation of those ingredients when we add heat and time and fermentation and all these other baking tools to the equation – Flavor is evoked or emerges. It emerges from the flour. And the, the difference between a world-class great baker and an average everyday baker is who, who evokes the most flavor. That's really the bottom mm -hmm. line. And, and we're all working with the same basic ingredients, flour, water, salt, yeast, and maybe a few, you know, additions like fat and sugars and, you know, enhancements. But really, those four are the foundational ingredients. So what allows flavor to emerge and ultimately what allows it to emerge is that the starch molecules that make up 80 percent or so of the flour um, they have to release some of the natural sugars that are the composition of those starch molecules so starch itself basically is a weaving together of all different kinds of sugars like glucose fructose maltose levulose dextrose these are all small little chains of saccharides or sugars that when woven together like threads create a ball of yarn and that ball of yarn is the starch so starch is like the, the big trunk of the tree the branches that are smaller uh, breakouts of those starches and then there are the sugars that represent kind of the twigs and and the goal of the fermentation process is to allow enough of those twigs to break free from the starch and that happens through enzyme activity amylase enzymes which exist in the flour sometimes additional ones are added in the form of uh, malted barley flour which is loaded with enzymes uh, those enzymes their purpose is to go into the starch molecules and to break free some of the smaller chain sugars that we can actually taste for sweetness and flavor and so the goal and here's the balancing act again 
The goal of the baker is to break enough sugar free from the starch to leave enough starch behind to hold the dough together when it bakes and, and to gelatinize. Starches will gelatinize, but to release enough sugar so that we can taste them on our tongue in terms of sweetness and also to caramelize because sugars will caramelize, but starches won't. They will just thicken it's because they're too complex. So the sugars that break free have the potential of caramelizing to give us that beautiful golden crust. So this beautiful loaf of bread is a result of caramelization of sugars, gelatinization of starches, and coagulation of proteins, the gluten proteins and any other proteins that are in there, that's coagulation. Those three components, it's another kind of triangle, uh, mm -hmm. are the transformations that take place. So when I call bread a transformational product, I mean that sugars, starches, and proteins are being transformed through the action of heat, the application of heat, while it's driving off moisture, and it has to drive off moisture in order to attain a temperature hot enough to gelatinize the starches and to caramelize the sugars. All these things work together. In other words, a lot of drama is going on in a dough when it's <laughs> transforming from flour transformed into dough and dough transformed into bread or crust. And uh, and it is a journey. In fact, we, we chart it out usually as a 12 stage journey from wheat to eat. And in between wheat and eat is all sorts of changes that are taking place. And most of that happens during fermentation, which brings us back to the original question of why is longer fermentation better? And, and is it necessary? And is there such a thing as too much fermentation? And the answer right, is right. yes to all of those. Um, and, and also the answer is it depends. It depends on a lot of factors, <laughs> like what temperatures we're using, how much you know leaven we put into the dough. And when we say leaven, it can be yeast or it can be even natural sourdough leaven. Uh, so, so, um, so there's no one answer to the question, it, the, the, which brings us back to the other part of the answer, which it depends, and it, and it partly depends on how much time do you have. And if you well, have a long time, some some pizzerias now are fermenting for 96 hours, which is what three, four days. I know a couple pizzerias that like to ferment for five days before they use the dough. Is it really necessary to get a great pizza in five days? In my opinion, no, it's not. But but one of the reasons why they choose to do that is because they may be using a very strong high protein flour that gives them a little bit more extensibility uh, over time as the other enzymes that are in the flour, the protein enzymes called protease, that's different from amylase, which is a starch enzyme, protease enzymes, break proteins down and they make them a little bit more extensible. And so again, it's all a balancing act. So the choice of flour is a factor, the temperatures that you're holding them at, you know, allows that enzymes will continue to work even when the dough is cold, even though the yeast itself might go dormant and not over ferment the dough. Um, can you get a great pizza dough in six hours instead of in 36 hours? You can get a, a, a good pizza dough. I believe that it's ideal to give the enzymes at least nine to 12 hours to do their work to begin to break some of the sugars free. But if you don't have that much time, then you can accelerate that process by adding some pure enzyme powder in the form of uh, malted barley flour, as long as it's active, active. And and uh, and some people say you can add that. So a lot of the mills add it into the flour anyway to give you good browning. But if you want to accelerate it, you can buy some, some straight diastatic malt, which it means it's still active. The enzymes have not been cooked and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, basically, um, what's the word? Uh, uh, I'll think of the word in a second, but they, they're, they're still active. There's non-diastatic, which is used like in uh, bagels. It's just for flavor. It's dormant. Yeah, it's dormant. And uh, and the the, uh, the enzymes, you know, no longer have active properties of breaking the starches apart, but they have nice flavor. So you put them in a bagel dough. But in a, um, in a, in a dough where you want to accelerate uh, the breakout of sugars, you can add a diastatic malt, no more than about a half a percent of the weight of the flour. Any more than that, and the, the, you lose control of the dough, the enzyme activity can get so fast that the dough could actually go over that balancing point of, of some of those starches get turned into sugars and, and too much. So, so you end up with a well, kind of a gummy dough instead of a nice balanced sort of open crumb dough. Yeah, well, and that's and Amy Nelson Mortensen. She has another question. I'll get to that here in just a second, Amy. Um, I appreciate you putting that up there. I did want to, I was trying to find a picture. I have a great picture of a dough that I made that has we call it the spider web structure inside. So I was I've been sitting here, you guys have been seeing me darting over there. I've been trying to Google this. 
So Can't what we got see. here is, is something similar to that. Neat, um, nice. Yeah. If you open up the just the top crust, you can see this is what is forming on the inside. This is what gives it that light and airy structure. That's right. And like what you're seeing crust. in this picture, Brian, is the threads of gluten, those threads that are holding it all together that are like the spider webs. That's the protein. That's the gluten yep. that has been formed during mixing. Uh, and it holds it together and it traps carbon dioxide. And the carbon yes. dioxide is a result of fermentation. And, and so uh, if you have a high protein flour, you can have much stronger threads of gluten holding it together. Uh, but if you don't have any fat in there, if it's a high protein flour and you have no fat, then those, those proteins are going to be very hard. We call it hard mm -hmm. flour. Uh, so it's, again, finding that balance point. Bread flour has a little less uh, protein and all purpose flour, even less uh, of the gluten. But that's a wonderful structure right there because you're seeing what we call large irregular holes. And that's a goal for, for a lot of artisan bakers. The goal is to have large irregular holes, meaning as opposed to even regular size holes, like medium sized regular holes, which you get from long mixing and, uh, you know, like punching the dough down and being hard on the dough. If the dough rises back on its final rise and gives you irregularity like that, it usually means that you've handled the dough gently. You've got enough hydration or enough water in the dough so that you're getting an irregular structure instead of the dough being overly organized and giving you even holes. It's properly under organized. And this is again, you know, as, because the artisan baker wants the larger regular holes and the larger regular holes allow the heat to penetrate to the center of that dough faster than the smaller holes. So it conducts the heat better, drives off moisture more quickly, and at the same time doesn't overbake the dough. See, there's a yeah. lot of things that are going on that we never think about, unless you think about it, uh, that affect the final outcome. And if you get something well, like yeah. that, that's, that's beautiful no, like that. It's typically going to also just, taste better. I just ordered another book uh, about mastering bread uh, from Mark Vetri. Mark uh, Vetri, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, this this is what I want. Every time I try to make – it becomes – it's anytime I try to make bread, it's dense like a yoga mat. It's like you're saying. It's not even the smaller – I think not even uh, medium I lost holes, you. It's, it's small. So – this is what I want. The artisan bread that you put out at the in an Italian restaurant for, you know, your appetizers. That's yeah. what I'm looking for. But you can also get this in a pizza crust to a lesser extent. I mean, because as you as you uh, slap out your pizza dough, you're you know, you're compressing a lot of the inside. But you want to keep that cornichone light and airy like this, especially exactly. like that. And this is and, and what I learned from you is that the well, the long fermentation adds a lot of um this time to build the structure and build some flavor as well. I mean, this is what you want. I mean, the longer you can let it go, more structure and flavor. That's right. It gives it, and you don't have to mix the dough for very long uh, because, which means that you won't get that over organized structure, but it will allow the, the, the gluten to just develop slowly on its own. The, the gluten doesn't have to be mixed for a long time for it to develop. The gl gliadin and gluten and proteins that compose gluten exist in the flour they will find each other um, just through agitation of the dough. And as long as you get a dough that is mixed to the point where it's not lumpy anymore, um, then, then the, the gluten is, devel is, is developing, it's, it's bonding. The gliadin and the glutenin are matching up and creating a strong molecule. And then over time, you know, uh, and as, as you shape the final pizza and this and that, you can organize them a little bit more, but you're not going to over-organize them. By the way, Mark Vetri, for many of your, your viewers probably already know this, um, he is one of the great greatest chefs in America. Uh, he is a Michelin starred, uh, probably one of the top three Italian food chefs in America, uh, operates out of Philly and also has uh, a, a number of pizzerias, Pizzeria Vetri, in which, you know, he's taken some of his, his uh, white tablecloth skills, applied them to, to making great pizzas. And he's put out his first bread book. He's done a pasta book and he's done other kinds of books. This time he's doing one on bread. In which he, uh, he's still went on mastering pizza too, which I also mastering pizza book, and then now mastering bread. And, uh, yeah. and Mark and his co-authors are really um, top of the line. Well, no, we're definitely trying to go up there on uh, that area. Visit V and M Bistro, uh, Kenneth Square Specialties uh, in Pennsylvania, the mushroom capital of the world. I'm trying to do like a, a I'm trying to do my own triangle of, of visits up there. So maybe you can get him on the phone with me. He hasn't responded to me yet. But, he's, tired, he's very yeah. hard to get a hold of, but he is going to be speaking. He's a busy guy. He's going to be speaking at my bread symposium. I'm uh, start next week. 
we're going to be putting out mailers and opening up ticket sales for the International Symposium on Bread. Uh, and it's not really, it'll be, a, you know, obviously a little touch of pizza, but really it's all about bread, the future of bread. And it's my fourth year doing this, but this is the first time we're going to do a virtual symposium. If anybody's interested in getting information, write to me at symposium at jwu.edu. Edu is, you know, it's Johnson & Wales. So it's symposium at jwu.edu. And we'll get you on the mailing list so that you can look into whether you want to come to that. We have uh, 24 weeks of amazing speakers, some of the, th the top bread people in the world and Mark and his and, and his co-authors on the book are going to be on on one of those weeks uh, talking about their vision of the future of bread. So we'd love to okay. have all of your viewers yeah. join. And the tickets I'm going to be there is it SYM Posium? Uh, yes, SYM P O S I uh, U M I U M Symposium. Yeah, U M. I got J it. I got it. JWU.edu. Yeah. That link is in the comments. If anybody wants to go look there and sign up for that, uh, I definitely will be. I was just uh, proud of myself for spelling symposium right the first time. <laughs> I, know, um, I couldn't even get it, keep it straight in my head. <laughs> but the, all right. So uh, also we have Bill Saladay has another question. But the, Bill, I'm going to get to your one next. Uh, I really like that. It's about cold fermentation. But just real quick, Peter. Um, Amy Nelson Mortensen says, "Hi, Peter. Thanks for being here today. Do you have any experience with dough rounders?" Any changes to her dough performance utilizing one? So if she utilizes one, is it going to affect you know her dough recipe or the dough performance? I should say with her regular recipe. Well, dough rounders are really you know important tools when you, especially when you're doing volume. And it's certainly you know I I love rounding my dough by hand. You know just because it, I love the touch of dough. But it, it, the practicality is is that if you're in volume you mode and you need to crank it up, then the rounders you know are important. Uh, and most of the rounders, especially the, the ones that are more contemporary, uh, do not beat up your dough. That's the, the fear of a, quote, artisan baker is that equipment will mm -hmm. tend to beat up your dough. And by beating it up, they mean it handles them roughly and kind of makes them more um, uh, tough, tougher. But well, I've, I've always heard it's like, you know, you put so much care and time into creating that dough structure and the airiness in it and the CO2 buildup that once you put it in a rounder, you, I mean – John Arena, when we had him over here, if I pulled out a, a, a rolling pin, he would beat me with it. <laughs> so it's like you, big... everything you've just done, you're, you're you know, moving from. But, I mean, as That's long right. as you can kind of keep the crust or the cornichone so you at least still have some of yeah. that effort that you put into but it. But the fact of the matter is is that there's phenomenal bread out there that artists and bakers are making using rounders and using equipment. It can be done. Uh, I know John Arena, his biggest tools are these. These hands, that's his, his, yeah. his <laughs> and, and that's, and that's true. That's the original mixers and the original rounders, but, absolutely. but rounders will do that. And then also this is where longer fermentation pays off because if you then round that dough and are not going to try to turn it into a pizza in two hours, but are going to give it another overnight, you know, uh, cold fermentation, that dough will relax. And, and only, it doesn't take that long for the, for the, the effect of the rounding to, uh, sort of settle down and relax. So I have no problem with using rounders when when mm -hmm. you need them because you know anything that will allow you to produce the volume of product that you need to produce in your operation. Again, let's just say that you feel that the rounding is making your doughs a little tough. Then that might be a time to consider adding another one or two percent of fat of oil or fat to your dough to help tenderize it because remember that fat will help coat the protein coat coat the gluten and help to keep it more tender. So there are ways to balance the scales when you find that, uh, you know, you're not getting the results that you want, but you need to be able to, to work at volume because you're going to burn out your staff if every one of them has to round those dose by hand if your volume is way beyond that. P a pizzeria Moza in L.A., Nancy Silverton's, you know, mm -hmm. famous pizzeria, makes some of the best pizza I've ever had. It is all produced in the La Brea Bakery in Los Angeles on, a, on equipment. But you would never know that when you taste that pizza that's produced at the restaurant afterwards because it's had a nice long relaxation period, you know, at, at cold temperatures. So by the time that the that the pizza makers get it at the restaurant, the dough has relaxed and you get a perfect crust. All right. Well, that's I, I think that answered that very I hope that nicely. Uh, what do you think, Amy? 
See, oh, she has another thing. We hand toss each one by hand, just having a hard time keeping up with the rounding per volume, which is great and exciting. So, well, if, are if, you saying, Amy, are you saying you're having a hard time uh, getting the rounder to keep up with the volume? Because I did talk with somebody else the other day. They, they have a rounder that I get to play with, which I've never – not a rounder, but the no press. But they said that they, you know, man versus machine, man wins every time as far as volume and, and time. So well, that's – so if she means by rounder, I think of a tool that takes a, a dough rounds and rounds it into right. a ball. If you're talking about pressing it out, then then you can use anything from a sheeter to a dough press. Yeah, those are pretty hard on your dough. I mean, you are going to there's a trade off. There's a sacrifice in terms of tenderness again, and one way to counterbalance that might be to increase the amount of fat. Okay, well, and she was saying that she was having a hard time. The, their staff keeping it up by hand. Um, so, you know, you can definitely use a dough press to kind of to round that out. No pun intended. But, uh, uh, you know, like uh, Peter was saying is that um, it, it just it takes away a little bit from the dough. So um, you just got to be delicate with your dough uh, and just uh, kind of subject it to as much uh, abuse as it can actually right. take. So She says, "Like a roundomatic." Uh, uh, Brian, your your uh, connection broke down. Yeah, and I know Peter's been coming in and out, or might be my internet, but um, you know, this is the the age of virtual uh, meetings. So, I do want to go back to Bill Sellerday. Um, if you plan on a long cold fermentation time, should you use less yeast? Does adjusting the yeast based on fermentation time change the complexity of the dough? And that's a great question. That's actually one I had on my list too. Um, only not as actually well, the, complex as your question, so that's great. But one of the rules of thumb is, you know, the, here's a couple, we, we'll say rules of thumb, and again, it's not a dogmatic rule, it's just sort of a general guideline, is you only want to mix the dough as long as it takes to get the job done, if you want those, you know, that large open crumb. So mix it from a mixing standpoint, mix the dough as long as it takes to get the job done. From a fermentation standpoint, only use as much yeast as it takes to get the job done. So if you use more yeast than you need, then everything's going to happen a lot faster, and that shortens, narrows the window of uh, mm -hmm. sort of uh, what's the word of uh, uh, your fermentation, just the, yeah. the, the usability, the margin of error, yeah, the life. margin of error, oh, where you can okay. ferment. So, so for a long fermentation, one nice advantage is you can cut way back on the yeast. Now, you know, a standard recipe would typically have two percent. Uh, commercial yeast, or maybe 0.65% uh, instant yeast uh, to, to flour as a standard for, for most kinds of breads. And that will give you a perfectly serviceable dough that will stand up to a two to three day fermentation. But you could go down to as low as 0.5%, or even I've seen some people go down as, as low as 0.25% yeast to flour if you're using instant yeast. Um, uh, and for a nice long fermentation dough, but again, if you don't, if you have a small amount of yeast, you have a lot wider window for the yeast to not over ferment the dough. It will work very nicely, um, but you want to have a dough that's moist enough. So that during the final rise and goes into the oven, it's not fighting against a very tight, stiff dough because it doesn't have as much push power if it's just a small amount of it. So make sure that your hydration gives you a very pliable, soft, I call it uh, supple dough as opposed to a mm -hmm. tight dough. Now, if you're doing rolling, if you need to roll out your dough, as we were just discussing, and you want to use like a sheet or some kind of a rolling machine, uh, even like a pasta or something that kind of presses and squeezes that dough, you might need it to be a little stiffer because it'll get stuck in the in the in the in the wheels of the of the you know shaping, um, then then you definitely need you can't have that extra hydration. So you might need extra yeast to be able to get that that push. So it's uh, anything that affects you may have to cut down on the amount of water, and you may have to uh, uh, cut down on the time of fermentation. So all these things are the balancing act. Uh, I get sometimes emails from people that say, you know, I really love my pizza dough. Everything's working fine. What can I do to make it better? 
And I, my first question is, why do you want to make it better if you're happy with it? You know, what, what part of it do you want to change? And, they, and sometimes it's that, well, I want to be able to get it done in less time. Or I want to know, you know, what, whether I would, it would get even better if I waited longer. And sometimes it, it won't change it. I find that certain doughs are perfect at, let's just say, 24 hours. If you make it the day before and the next day, it's great. And, and in 36 hours and 48 hours, it's not much different. It's almost exactly the same. And by the third or fourth day, it may be a little um, more difficult to stretch it by hand because some of the enzyme activity is beginning to, or the acids that are forming in the dough through fermentation are beginning to break down the gluten. So again, these are all sort of factors. Um, but yeah, the, I would say that there's usually a sort of a sweet spot for most doughs. Somewhere between 18 and 36 hours is a really good sweet spot. But some doughs yeah. you might find will benefit at 48 and 72 and 96 hours. Um, and there are some formulas, I'll be honest with you, this is an opinion. I, I don't have stats to prove this, but I think that a lot of doughs are great with very elaborate instructions and it's like 120 hours of fermentation and you know 90% hydration and all this stuff and all those things and you get a great dough. The question that a lot of people ask is, but would it be just as great if I shortened the time and it wasn't 90% but it was only 80% hydration? And very often the answer is yes, it would probably be just as great. But because it works and when you have a system and a formula that works, you don't want to mess with it. You just don't yeah. want to create kind of an ironclad rule that says this is the only way to get there. But if it works, you don't need to fix it if it's not broken. So, you know, bear that in mind as we talk about all of these things. Uh, we want to yeah. tweak these things if you feel like it needs to be improved. Oh, absolutely. You know, you got to make sure that you watch it. And I, and I think I'm just talking about this and I'm going to write it down, too, is another thing about overproof dough. Um, when is it overproofed? How do you know it's overproofed? And damn it, what can I do with it? So yeah. Yeah. not today. Don't ask me any questions today, guys, because they will not get answered. But overproof dough, I am writing it down right now. But we do have another question. And I uh, think- Let me just answer, over... let me give a very, Brian, let me just give a very quick answer to uh, one thing. How do you know if it's overproof? One way that you know is number one, you smell the alcohol because that means, it, yes. like, means it's, it's like a brewery. Bad. You won't get as beautiful caramelization because it means that the yeast has eaten up that natural sugar that was released through fermentation and it hasn't left enough for caramelization in the oven. That's the sign of over fermentation. How do you fix it? We'll talk about that at another time. There you go. Perfect. I love that teaser trailer right there. Thank you so much, Peter. That was awesome. And I love the, the conversation we're getting back and forth with our pizzeria uh, operators, Amy and, uh, and Jim and Bill. Um, I do have another one. Uh, I had that question lined up, but it was, uh, again, I think not Bill Saladay, but Jim Schuster. He, he was saying, you know, time permitting, he wanted to know about freezing dough. Um, or no, I'm sorry, maybe it was uh, Tim, actually. Yes, it was Tim Rosh. Again, um, you know, time allowing. How? What are your thoughts on freezing dough? Is it, you know, he appreciates it. Good job on the show, and you're always a great guest. But, I mean, freezing dough at this point, we're doing a long fermentation We've talked about, I mean, you know, difference of hydration, and there's so much more that we can actually get into. I really love that we've had so much interaction here. We haven't been able to really stay on topic. So <laughs> we might just, next one, say, doors open. What are your questions? That might we'll be easier than that. having yeah. a topic. Well, let me just say that freezing is a totally valid approach. If you're going to freeze your dough, I would freeze it on the uh, early, in the early stages. Uh, I would have a very short first fermentation. While the dough is freezing, it's going to take a little bit of time for it to freeze unless you have a, a blast freezer. So you don't want to create a lot of alcohol in the dough before you freeze it. Um, but freezing will arrest the leavening and it will, it will stop the fermentation. So it will kind of put it in a state of arrested development <laughs> or hibernation. Nice. And, um, and, um, and then when you thaw it, the best way to thaw that dough is to move it to the refrigerator for at least 24 hours to slowly thaw without waking up so that when you are ready to actually turn turn it into pizza it's already soft enough and ready to go into its final you know final uh, fermentation which typically is you know maybe about two hours from the time you pull it out of the refrigerator till a two to three hour window before it goes into the oven the firm the, the freezing cycle kind of serves as the first bulk fermentation so you don't need to first, do not first bulk ferment the dough 
then divide it. But after you mix it, give it maybe 20 minutes of floor time, then divide it and then freeze it and give it and give it enough room to, you know, in, in whatever you're freezing it in so that it's not being uh, uh, trapped by a pa plastic bag or something like that. Give it some expansion. Yeah. It will rise. It'll ferment for the first 30 minutes of uh, in a standard freezer before it chills down enough. But yeah, freezing is a great way to, and 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 uh, you can hold the dough for months uh, and get great results if you don't over ferment it uh, or not over ferment it, but ferment it too much during the first rise. Well, Jim Schuster says he's uh, he tried freezing your dough as a test. He wasn't thrilled, but it was okay. Um, maybe some of this, I, you know, it's always anytime you wrap a dough, even to just put it in the refrigeration, you got to give that room to grow. You don't want to wrap it up tight in that saran wrap so it has no room to expand because, again, you're arresting that process. You're, you're just impeding all the work you've just been doing. So but What we don't know from Jim is, is at what point did he freeze it? Did he, did he give it a first rise and then divide it and shape it and freeze it? Or did he take it right off the mixer and divide it and shape it and freeze it? Because if, if he did the first thing, if he let it rise once, then I would say try it again. But this time, don't give it a bulk fermentation shape it within 20 minutes of uh, coming off the mixer and uh, and then freeze yeah. it and see if that makes a difference. No, absolutely. And I'm sure he's getting ready to, to put up a, a, a point up there. So, but here's another thing that, that, you know, maybe for the next time we can have some of these little um, timetables down, you know, if we want to do a, a cold ferment or, you know, he, Jim, Jim says he did it after shaping. So, how how long after shaping, Jim? Did you shape it right after you made it? And then uh, you know I'll wait for him to respond. Uh, Amy Mortensen again is saying she she freezes once in a while for knots. Um, she freezes them after the first rise. Now, Amy, well, are you uh, do you do you have good results from that? She says it's a good idea, Peter. But I you know I think in the end, how does the product come out at the end? If you're getting good browning good caramelization in the crust, a nice flavor, and you're not tasting any sort of, uh, you know, alcohol residual stale beer flavors and things like yeah. that, then 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 there's no nothing to fix. Uh, if you find that the color of the knots uh, is a little paler than you would like, then you would probably want to um, do the shaping and freezing earlier in the process. All right. Well, and then um, it seems like she's having a good time with that it's not necessarily hurting her uh, jim schuster says yes so i assume that's you know right after shaping um you know it just goes right into a, a refrigeration or freezing at that point so right after just a different right. yeah well he can cut back on the yeast then okay maybe cut back 10 percent on the yeast and see if again when he says he's not through thrilled by the results. We, I don't know what that means. Like, uh, uh, it gets, it gets tricky because we don't know which part of it you're not thrilled with. Is it, is, does, and, and how is it different from if you're making the dough and not freezing it? Uh, so if you can well, get more specific, uh, we could probably deal with that on the next, on the next show, you know, but we, we'll give you some ranges of things to play with. Yeah, no, we got a couple more minutes, but he says he does not store his dough in a plastic bag. It's a dry process using rice flour. And maybe that's the difference. It could be. I mean, you were just talking about, you know, what the difference may be. I mean. Here's what I would suggest to Jim. Jim, if you would write to me and 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 de give me the details of your MOP, method of preparation, and kind of give me your steps, including the time frames in between and the level of hydration in your dough, you know, uh, I can give you back something, a, a more, uh, you know, well thought out answer uh if i know more specifically what you're trying to do yeah and absolutely uh email peter at peter at pizzaquest.com um he's, he's you know he's ready to answer all your guys's questions and i and this is what i love is that back and forth between everybody here so i'm gonna go back down because i know uh amy and uh tim were talking about some stuff so uh basically amy likes what you were saying uh, again, Amy, if you need more clarification, just because we're going back and forth between three or four people, email Peter at, uh, you know, Peter at PMQ or PMQ.com. We'll get that set up one day. No, <laughs> Peter at well, PizzaQuest.com. If, if you send them to PMQ, then Brian can forward them on to me. So uh, Yeah, you can send them to Brian at PMQ.com. I'll send them right over to Peter. Um, so, Tim, he says is uh, five minutes out of the mixture directly to quart freeze bags, and it works well for him. So. 
I mean, that's a good method for Tim. Uh, might be different for other people with different recipes. Um, I mean, it's always a good oh, place to start. Five minutes out of the mixer, directly to the sports freezer. So he's placed, yeah, so he's doing But I mean, even if it's different recipes, it's a good place Tim, to start. And I like the back and forth that, you know, yeah. I'm going to start with it, somebody else's idea. And then from there, I can adjust it to my own recipe. So. And when you, and by the way, those of you who write to me with, with the, your MOP, uh, if you could also tell me the type of flour that you're using, whether it's a, you know, high gluten flour or a bread flour or an all-purpose flour, any anything more specific than the, because all the, like we said, every little factor is part of the balancing act. And sometimes yeah. uh, you're doing everything right. And the only tweak that might be needed is changing maybe the type of flour or a percentage of one of the ingredients. So uh, it can be very subtle. Yeah, absolutely. Um Peter, you know, we're getting up to the, the one hour mark. Uh, we can go all day with this, but we want to save some more episodes. So I want to let you get a final affirmation, but I also want to let everybody else. Um, okay, here, well, we just got one. Uh, Steve Menzel just came in the last second here. We'll put this up there and then we'll go. Um, what is the best hydration percent for deck ovens like Baker's Pride uh, versus conveyor ovens? You know, as far as like, I guess, as far as just any kind of dough production, do you need more hydration for a deck oven versus a conveyor or is it vice versa? That's a tricky one. I think partly it depends on the type. If you're trying to do kind of like a New York style pizza, classic, you know, like uh, sort of deck style pizza, um, the range will depend on the flour that you're using. Um, so part of it is finding a range that gives you a nice supple dough. Uh, with a particular brand of flour that you're using that allows you to, you know, stretch it, you know, pretty easily to open it up and um, and then try to get it. Well, here's the other rule of thumb, baking. So the you want to bake it only as long as it takes to get the job done. But if you can bake it faster rather than slower, you're going to get a creamier texture. And creamy is good in this case. Uh, you want a crisp under crust, a crisp cornicion. And, but yet you want to retain enough moisture so that when you bite into it, the, the, the crumb of the dough, the internal part of the dough, whether it's that thin little, little section in the bottom crust or the, in the, in the cornicium is still creamy, almost like has a custard, like, you know, quality, like a great artisan bread would have. And so to get to achieve that, the less time it spends in the oven, the better. Now, if you're looking for a cracker type crust and you want to, you know, and you, and you're, and it's a very tight, Cornicione that because of the style of pizza that you're making, then you might need to go at a lower temperature for a longer period of time. But if you're looking for that creamy texture, or if that's you know if that's what you want to achieve, then you want to bake it a little faster at a slightly higher temperature uh, so that you get the caramelization. Remember, these are the three transformations: sugars caramelize, starches gelatinize, proteins coagulate. All three of those things have to happen. Those oven transformations must occur in order for the, the dough to be transformed into bread or crust. So finding that sweet spot temperature-wise that gives you all of those things happening pretty much at the same time and yet uh, evaporating only enough moisture to get you the structure and the texture that you want, it, you know, it's all a matter of tweaking a few temperatures, uh, a few degrees up or down, a few minutes up or down. But I, my ideal baking time for me, my favorite sort of time in an oven is about four and a half to five minutes for me to get the texture that I like in a pizza. And so if you if your pizza is spending seven minutes in the oven, you might be able to get it more creamy if you can get it out in five minutes, which means you might have to increase the temperature a little bit. So, but, so and all those things are tweaks that are really de decided by the pizza maker based on how you like it and how your customers like mm -hmm. it. Uh, there's nobody who can tell you that's right or wrong. It's what works for you and your customers. Okay. Well, I mean, you, you but you're, you're able to give them kind of a baseline a starter point. Um, Steven, thank you so much for that question. That was a great one. Uh, Tim Ross, or I'm sorry, Tim Roush. Uh, yeah, he just wants to say who's the, whose water evaporates best out of the dough in the oven. I'm pretty sure that's a New York water joke. Thanks for hey, tuning hey, in. Tim, you're, getting of, you're getting a lot of airtime today, man. You're th hey. <laughs> Thanks for being a part of this. You're right. <laughs> But the, yeah, no, that that was kind of a poke in yeah, the bear thing uh, right there. Whose water evaporates the best out of the dough? What does that mean? Whose water evaporates the best out of the dough? 
Oh, I, mean, I, he, I was. That was a joke thing. To, I, I didn't think you were oh, going to actually answer it, Peter. I, I, I assumed oh, it was like a New York water joke. Um, I, that, I was wondering if it was a New York water joke. Uh, and that, we should let's 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 tease this. I think we okay. need to address the myth of New York water at, at, in our next episode. Okay. I'm writing them down. I've got I've got a whole list of, of stuff we're going to be doing. Thanks to you guys and Tim. We know you're joking, but I mean, you struck a chord with Peter. So the myth of New York water um, doesn't have to be New York water either. I mean, they they have a company that makes water for any region anywhere. So, but I like that. Um, and, the, and so the question is: is the is the type of water? Are the is the water? Does the water make a difference in flavor? Absolutely. Um, so, well, um, you are you back, Brian? You're, you're. Oh, it was me. Okay. All right. So, Amy Nelson, uh, she's asking uh, about baking at four to five minutes bake. What temp are you baking at? I would say for four to five minute bake, you got to be going 650, 700 degrees. Um, what do you think? Yeah, it depends. Again, on Baker's Pride, I would say at least 600. Six, when you get to 700, you could be in trouble. Again, if you have big loads and lots of pizzas going in, you might have to be that high. But I would say somewhere around 600, uh, 6, 625. But it, it depends with a conveyor oven. Uh, the settings vary depending on the type of conveyor. If you're using a, a WOW or if you're using, you know, some other Marshall Metal type, you know, they're all different. Yeah. Uh, but, but once you find the setting that allows that the throughput, to come out in somewhere around between four and a half and five minutes, you're going to be in the game. You're going to be in the game of getting a great pizza that's both caramelized, crispy, and yet still creamy and not not dry. And uh, and and that's and that's just finding the settings that will work for you. But in a in a deck oven like a, a Baker's Pride, um, a, a lot will depend whether you're on the top of deck or the lower deck. You know, a lot will depend on the uh, uh, the amount of the number of pizzas that you're trying to bake at any one time. Yeah. No, and, and I did find the the follow up that Stephen Menzel sent. Um, he was his initial question was assuming the deck oven is like 550 to 575 degrees, and the conveyor is like 465, 475. I yeah. think you've answered those questions. If not, Stephen, you know, email him at peter at pizzaquest.com. He's going to answer all your yeah. questions. Aaron Rodriguez, I saw your comment. I agree. But uh, email me at brian at pmq.com. Um, just, just email me. So um, at this point, is there a um, – well, here I wanted to say that uh, to, so we had such great response today. Send all of your um, suggestions for dough questions that you would have. And we can we're, – we're looking at doing this monthly, right, Peter? Monthly maybe every – Yeah, we're going to try to – well, yeah, we'll, we'll try to come. I know other people will be also chiming in talking about dough. Uh, uh, our good friend Michael Calanti will be talking about sourdough. Uh, Absolutely, up. yeah. We're wow! Look at you. You're ready to go. Yeah, you know, Michael Calanti. We're going to be talking with him uh, actually next Thursday, a week from now, about sourdough and kind of gearing up towards uh, um, National Sourdough Day. But I, I do appreciate that the reminder on that. Um, yeah. So you know, tune in for that. But we're going to be talking about how to uh are you looking over there i'm looking over here you can see me there we go i can see you brian <laughs> behind behind michael's picture i can see you there you go <laughs> no we're going to be talking with uh, uh michael Calanti about you know how to make a sourdough starter um how to manage it and then what to do with it when you have it so um, we're going to do that but then you know we'll, uh, i, I also want to delve into a lot of different topics that we even got here today we we barely scratched the surface on what this whole thing was supposed to be about today but I love that because people want to know how to make dough. Um, and I think next time we'll just kind of chuck it up, have just the, the smallest of topics, and then everything else is just what people want to ask you. Are you ready for that, Peter? Sounds good. I'll, I'll do my best. With you You know, you can stump me because there's a lot of things I don't know. None of us know everything. And uh, that, you know, we lost, I love that. We lost, we lost our dough doctor, you know, Tom Lehman, uh, irreplaceable, uh, and it'll take a team of us. Me, Michael, everyone else who you've got coming on, you know, to try to replace the, the amount of knowledge that he had. But even Tom would tell me that, that he still he was still learning, you know, right up to the end because uh, it's a fathomless subject. And you'll hear things maybe even over the next couple of weeks where somebody says something slightly different than what I say, because a lot of it is a combination of, of 
knowledge and, you know, sort of science, and some of it is craft and personal choice as well. So in the end, yeah. I say the, the most important takeaway today is if, if it's working for you, you know, the way you're doing it, you don't have to fix it if it's not broken. If there's something that you feel needs to be improved, identify what part of it that you'd like to be improved and then give me a formula that, you know, in your current method that you're doing it. And we might be able to see a way to tweak that to be able to get you the results you're looking for. Yeah. And then, and I, I appreciate you bringing that up, uh, Aaron Rodriguez. That's what you were going to email me about. So we did lose Tom Lehman um, last December. Um, so he had mentioned a uh, Peter versus the doctor battle, but you know, it's as much as I would have loved that, you know, we're, we, we just, there's a, like you said, there's a lot of big shoes to fill here and we have a lot of great people. And, and, and Peter, you, yeah. you're right up there. You are, I mean, basically, every time it, there was a question asked, I needed to jump in and make you stop talking because you just want to <laughs> talk so much about it and give us so much information. And that's a good thing. I can do that. <laughs> well, I have to get more information out of people. That's hard. Because <laughs> you can never have too much good pizza. And if anybody has any little piece of the puzzle, we want to share it because we want more and better Absolutely. pizza. Absolutely. So, you know, we're going to have uh, Peter, we're going to try to get him more involved in PMQ.com or PMQ Pizza Magazine. Uh, but also, like he said, Michael Colanti, uh, you know, author of How to Bake Bread, How to Bake More Bread. Um, he's an artisan bread baker. Uh, and basically, he took over your class when when you moved out. So, I mean, you guys are you're good yeah, friends. Michael, too, so. Michael and I both both taught at the California Culinary. Well, yeah. Yeah, we, we taught at the California Culinary Academy together. And when I moved to the East Coast to teach at Johnson & Wales, Michael took over my class and, and took it, you know, continued to develop it and went deeper and deeper into uh, other aspects that I haven't gone into. Uh, we both have gone deep into sourdough, but he's gone into the flavor aspect. He's, a, he's a, actually a, a certified flavor a taster. He, he's a certified taster, that's, believe it or not. And you can get certified. That, that. I saw that and I'm like, did he just make that up? I'm a taster. I'm a certified taster. I, I taste. I, I said that's a job I'd love to have, you know. But there's a science to learning how to taste. It. Also, <laughs> identifying the language, the, the the right way to describe flavors, so that you know it's functional and usable. Yeah. Well, usable about that. He's, well, uh, Tim Rosh, I see. Um, you know the. Well, I know that we've had some. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we've had a lot of connections today. Tim Rush is looking for the social media address for you. Um, I know it's Pizza Quest. Uh, well, www.pizzaquest.com. It's already that's, up in the comments at the, the that's very my top. Website. Yeah, uh, pizzaquest.com yeah. is the website. My email is peter at pizzaquest.com. Yeah, and that's, that's what I love about our contributors here is they are so open to talking with you guys. So, um, Amy Nelson uh, Mortensen, thank you so much again for chiming in and uh, being participatory. Uh, Tim Rosh, Aaron Rodriguez, uh, Bill Sellerday, oh, here, Steve Menzel, all you guys. Jim Schuster, of course. I mean, all you guys have these questions. If we haven't answered them now, I did put up there. If you want us to do uh, different um, segments, let me know. Email me at brian at pmq.com for suggestions for those segments. So, and you know, I'll work with Peter on this and we can see, you know, again, this is, we're talking monthly hopefully, you know, because we're all busy, but, uh, you know, we want to do something monthly, but I mean, if there are things that come up within the month, you know, dough wise, let us know. Uh, but you can always reach out to Peter every single day of the week. And, and, and please, uh, for those of you who want to get deeper into the bread side, uh, go to some, uh, go to symposium, write to me at symposium at jwu.edu to get on the mailing list. The symposium begins in May and it's going to run all the way to October. And every week we're going to be posting uh, new presenters, speakers, demos, all sorts of things for six months. Um, so we'd love to have you join uh, the, the thousands of the people who are going to be coming to the symposium. It'll be all virtual. Yeah, and absolutely. It's right there again, symposium, dot, or symposium at jwu.edu, Johnson Wales University.edu. So. JWU. Yes, thanks. Uh, and meanwhile, I think between now and next month, both of us will will try to figure out how to get these uh, these Zoom glitches to stop. Because I know some of it's weather related. I think. 
Yeah, I'm telling you right now, Peter, it's your internet because mine's fine. But it, it, it's it? good. We, it could be mine. Uh, I'll have to check. Maybe I need to reboot. It's all of ours. I think everybody had a great time. Uh, I do appreciate all the participation. I appreciate your time today. So I'm going to let everybody go. Uh, we'll see you guys next time. Uh, I'll see you guys next Thursday when we're talking to Michael Colante. Um, and we're going to learn a lot about sourdough for National Sourdough Day, Sourdough Bread Day on April 1st. So pass that. I want you guys to uh, stay safe, stay sane, and just you know be healthy and love everyone. And you know what? We're coming out of this. Let's get out there and be just love each other. Thank you so much for your time today, Peter. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Great being with you.